This is E2B, Energy to Business, a podcast by Opportune, where we bring you in-house expertise that serves all energy sectors. We examine emerging financial and technology trends and provide a broad perspective on ways to stay ahead, create opportunities, and execute market strategies. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of E2B, an opportune podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. And folks, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Energy to Business. We always appreciate you tuning in to some quality thought leadership from the broader energy industry as we explore different dynamics from finances to operations and more. As we dig deep into today's main talking points, I want to make sure you're getting all the opportune content you desire and make sure that you're caught up on all of our previous conversations as well. So make sure you're going to our website, opportune.com. Again, opportune com for more information on our solutions and services as well as other pieces of opportune thought leadership like videos articles obviously episodes of the podcast some blogs research papers and more and for just the podcast specifically you can subscribe to e2b energy to business on apple podcasts and spotify so just hit that subscribe button and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations plus notifications when we drop new ones So on today's episode of the show, we're going to be breaking down some strategies for maneuvering early stage investments in younger companies. This would be specifically around uh, private equity investments in the energy sector. That's where we'll hone in our conversation today. And really, we're wanting to answer the question, why might traditional valuation methodologies not be appropriate for new technologies or some of these early stage investments, right? What doesn't align and why? Let's get into the granular aspects of that. And this is difficult terrain to predict for investors since often these early stage companies rarely have good comparables and have yet to produce significant cash flow or even revenue. So how can you really tell if this private equity investment is worth your while or if you're putting in the right amount? And investors often try to estimate or guesstimate, if we're being honest, uh, to better understand or predict future cash flow to inform their investments. And what we're wanting to do is remove some of that estimation and try to get more granular on uh, deeper and less subjective metrics for defining methodologies for effective early stage investments in these early stage uh, companies, specifically, again, around private equity investments. So let's go ahead and dig in a little deeper. I'm pleased to welcome our guest today, Mr. James Hansen. He's a managing director with Opportune, over 30 years of experience in commercial and investment banking. James, great to have you on. How are you doing? Great. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a real pleasure getting to chat and source your perspective today. We've got quite a bit to unpack. And, uh, you know, if folks want some supplemental information around this, I want to point them to an article you've written on a similar topic that digs deep and uh, love the language in there, too. You uh, you keep things fun to read. So I'll point people in that direction if they want some supplemental material as we discuss our conversation today. Uh, but yeah, James, go ahead and give us a little bit more info on your background so folks understand the perspective that you're bringing here. Dig into how those 30 years of experience in commercial and investment banking uh, tie into or inform this perspective today around early stage private equity investments. Sure thing. Yeah, thanks. So I, like you said, I've been doing investment banking and related uh, activities for about 30 years. And that career has pretty much been split in half. So the first half of that was really traditional investment banking, M&A, IPOs, capital markets, uh, commercial lending, you know, kind of the full gamut. Um, and then uh, the second half is really focused more around fairness opinions, solvency opinions, valuations, and things like that. So um, uh, really been focused a, a lot of this in the last kind of decade and a half uh, going on in the energy world right now. This early stage and venture uh, uh, kind of valuation question ends up coming up a lot. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a tricky one. And like I mentioned in the intro, it's something that is pretty consistent for these early stage investments. I mean, would you agree there? Is this something that you find most professional uh, investors in the energy space have to deal with at some point in their careers? 
Yeah, although it's it's interesting. It's really, at least for me and even for Opportune, this has been a relatively new phenomenon that's kind of come along with the, you know, the energy transition. As, as we think about early stage and venture investing, it really kind of revolves around two aspects. The first would be, uh, you know, new technologies is kind of the, the easiest one to think about. Somebody's developing a new, you know, power generation technology or battery technology or, you know, better technology to, to sequester carbon from drilling oil and gas, something like that. The second is uh, along the lines of project finance. So, you know, if you have a, a power project or, uh, you know, any maybe if you're building a transmission line, a lot of times those uh, types of projects, you know, have a kind of a two phases. The first phase, which is the early stage when you're kind of site planning, thinking about what technology you're going to use, who's going to build it, what are the contracts you're going to need. And more and more private equity firms or maybe venture firms are, are kind of wading into that arena as well. So they're investing in a lot of these projects before they get to that stage, which we call kind of financial closing, where you've got all your contracts lined up, you've got all of your, um, you know, your permits, your site plan, your EPC, everything's ready to go. And you just, you know, you kind of eventually that's when you would have typically gotten the, uh, you know, the financial closing with the investment. But a lot of times these projects are being backed by private equity firms. And so they'll be in the portfolio at at an earlier stage. Let's go ahead and dig in deeper then into what the actual challenges are and what the dynamics are that are uh, shaping uh, again, private equity investments in the energy sector for these younger companies. Since uh, valuing venture or these early stage investments can be tricky, uh, like I mentioned, because there is typically uh, less revenue to pull from or to compare to and uh, potentially even little to no cash flow. uh, What are some of the key considerations for valuing these early stage businesses that you recommend investors take into consideration, right? What are the things that really matter? And what are some of the fluffy things that are maybe less important or that you can have a little bit of flexibility on, uh, you know, performance wise? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. And I, I guess I'll, I'll answer it by, you know, kind of pointing out the, the obvious that when most practitioners think about valuation and most investors, PE firms, valuation professionals like, like us, you know, obviously, the first three things that come to mind are what, what we might even call the big three, you know, discounted cash flow, public company comparable multiples and comparable transaction multiples. Those are kind of the, the gold standard in terms of putting together a, a valuation estimate for a company or valuation range. Um, you know, as, as essentially what we find in a lot of these early stage companies, and we'll, we'll talk to our, our clients about this, and a lot of times, you find that if people are really trying to squeeze the square hole of these early stage, square peg of these early stage projects into a round hole. Um, and, and, and I think that there, we, we try to, to caution and, and, you know, there is a, a, a point for that, which we can get into. But, um, you know, really, if you're looking at these kind of by definition, these early stage projects, you know, for one thing, they may not be necessarily comparable to anything. Uh, if, if you think about comparable multiples, you know, essentially you're trying to say, okay, for companies that are in a similar industry or a similar dynamic, and by that you're assuming, you know, similar growth rates, similar margins, similar, uh, you know, market size, similar, um, you know, cost dynamics, similar pricing dynamics. So there's a lot of things that go into that. And when you're looking at a lot of these early stage companies, you may not even know what the market is. You may not know how much it's going to cost to build. There's a lot of work that has to be done, you know, at the beginning. And a lot of the early stage investments are really made on an idea and, you know, kind of a thought that this, you know, this idea or project, if successful, would be a very, you know, economic business to have and 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 to invest in. So people will you know, put in early stage money with the hopes that, you know, that the, the development work will will lead to answer those questions. Well, to answer those questions, many investors or uh, management teams are tempted to try to solve some of these valuation issues by relying on DCF, discounted cash flow. Uh, can you give us first, before we dig into, is this effective in this context, how discounted cash flow informs some other types of investing in the energy industry? Where does it prove to be useful? 
Yeah, yeah. DCF or discounted cash flow is, is obviously, you know, really along with the other two is supporting. I, I would say that's a kind of a primary valuation technique. You look at projections going forward, usually developed by management teams that are the closest to their uh, product or industry and, and look at the cash flows of those businesses and, and move forward. And, and what's great about looking at DCFs is you really have a lot of flexibility to look at some of the items I mentioned earlier, growth rates, um, margins, uh, pricing, and you can really play with and, and, and look at, you know, nuances. You know, do we think that this uh, project is going to grow at 3% or 5% per year. You, you, you make a lot of, uh, you ask a lot of questions along those lines, you know, is, are the margins for this going to be, you know, 20% margins or 30% margins, a lot, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, with, with early stage investing and, and venture investing, what essentially happens is if, if you're really honest about those ranges and you say, okay, you know, we don't know if this is going to grow at 5% or 100% or 500%. You know, we don't even know where the starting point is going to be. Is this a, a market that is going to be, you know, a $100 million product or a billion dollar product or, or whatever? So if what, what we found is if, you know, a lot of times, you know, that's this is our starting point. A lot of times PE firms or even management teams or whatever will say, well, you know, why don't we just, you know, make assumptions, we'll make our best guess on all this stuff, and we'll use that as our, our valuation methodology. And, you know, that, that there is some logic in it, you know, it seems like that sometimes makes sense. But the reality is, if you do dig in and you say, okay, so we think this could be anywhere between a five or 500% growth rate, we think margins could be anywhere between 10% and 100%. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of really wide margins when you're developing a new business or a new uh, a new project that you just don't know where you're going to come out. And so, and we've actually done this exercise with clients. And what's what's interesting is if you layer on top of that, not only the, a lot of those assumptions that that can vary wildly. If you you know look at discount rate, you know usually when we're valuing a typical company. The discount rate discussion is based on, you know, nuances of maybe a, you know, a 2% range. And even that 2% range can be a pretty big range. Anybody that's that's done DCFs knows that when you vary the discount rate, you can get some pretty um, wide uh, ranges of value. One of the things that, that we looked at as, you know, just an example of this is the, the, the Fed did a study of required rates of return for different types of investments um, and they, you know, talk to a lot of private equity firm and venture firms. And for the, the category that they defined as venture capital early stage, and they defined that as, you know, things that were kind of in the concept stage, maybe not yet profitable, significant operational techni technological risk, no customers. Their range of discount rates was between 35 and 70 percent. That's a huge range. <laughs> So, so what we found is if, you know, if, if we really use honest ranges that go into these things and say, you know, what, what are, you know, what's, what's the realistic range that this is going to be, it often, and, and the, the, really the norm in these early stage companies or venture companies would be a range of value that's, you know, from negative to hugely positive. And so it's, you know, well, that's an honest range. It's just not very useful if you're trying to make decisions or a lot of the, the decisions that, you know, it may be, you know, a portfolio company of, of, of a private equity, a private equity firm is, you know, looking to transfer some assets from one portfolio to another. Um, you know, it may be that, you know, maybe one of the funds is going to invest in an earlier funds. And so you, you want to try to figure out, you know, where does that investment take place? And so as much as we love discounted cash flow for normal, uh, you know, regular way, companies, it's a, a, a lot of times, especially the earlier stage companies like this, it's just not appropriate. So then, I mean, you've kind of already answered this, but I just want to clarify, would you then say at large DCF should be at the very least reconsidered or uh, would you advise that uh, discounted cash flow just not be a metric used at all for gauging the success or the uh, style of investment? 
That's such a great question. And it really, unfortunately, when you're, at least with the work that we've done on venture and early stage valuation, it really ends up becoming um, more of a due diligence exercise than anything. And it's really trying to dig in, excuse me, dig into the, to the company and see, you know, where, where are they in their development? Uh, a, a lot of times, you know, there's an initial investment and then people will work and they'll, you know, work on the technology. They'll work to figure out what their market is. They'll work to figure out, you know, how do you ramp up this technology once you've got a proof of concept? And so a, a lot of times our job is to say, okay, we would like to use traditional valuation techniques, but a lot of times when you dig in and, and, and really, you know, ask about where they are in their process, there's just too many uncertainties. And so in, the, in those situations, you know, for lack of a better uh, methodology, what we often will end up using is a cost-based methodology. I'm glad you teed that up. I want to then expand on, you know, if we're not going with the traditional discounted cash flow methodology for gauging strategy around uh, these early stage investments, what is the best valuation methodology, right? What would you recommend as a replacement uh, and why? Right. And so I alluded to a, a cost based uh, valuation methodology. And, you know, that, that sometimes makes people even cringe a little bit because you think it's so simplistic. It's basically a cost based methodology. Just say how much have you spent getting this technology or project to where it is today? And the reason that we we often find that useful or relevant in the projects we're looking at is we'll want to ask our clients, why are you getting a valuation? So the, the most common uh, reasons could be, you know, in the, in the private equity world or venture world would be, well, we just want to value our portfolio. We want to know where our investments, you know, stand. That's probably the most most common uh, assignment that we get. But but it could even get a little trickier where they say, well, and I alluded to this earlier. It could they could say, well, we are going to move this investment from fund one, which is at the end of its life, to fund four. Uh, you know, just to just for you know, so we can close out fund one and give those people back their capital. And so we need a to get a price to sell this early stage investment from fund one to fund four, or similarly, maybe it's gonna stay in fund one, but fund one is fully funded and they, the company needs a little more money to continue their development. And so maybe fund four will step in and, and make those investments. So what price, how do, you, how do you price that equity that they're putting into the venture relative to what the other investors have done? And so, Really, what we'll do is 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 take a step back and say, okay, if you, you know, especially in those situations where you know there's people on either side, because the fund one investors may be different than the fund four investors. So if you're a fund one investor but you're not a fund four, four investor, you may say, well, this project has really ramped up, and it's you know it, when we put in our money, there was a lot more risk, and it's it's been completely de-risked, and you really should you know be valuing it a lot higher, whereas. The flip side of that is, is that somebody who's, you know, putting in the new money may say, well, wait a minute, you know, are, are we sure that this investment is still a good idea? You guys have been working on this for a while and it's still not, you know, ready for prime time. Is is this something that maybe should be written off? Are we are we buying your, you know, your dogs that should just be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, put to put to bed, so to speak. So, um, you know, so those are really some of the things that we look at. And what's what's interesting about that is it ends up becoming, you know, less of a, you know, throwing numbers in a spreadsheet exercise and more of a due diligence exercise. So what we'll do is we'll typically talk to the management teams, talk to the people who are actually working on the products um, and, and really dig in and try to see, you know, what work has been done, what work needs to be done, what's the plan, um, you know, where do you think this could be? Uh, where did you think it was when you started? What's, you know, what's, if there is such a thing as projections, what did they look like before? What do they look like now? I mean, again, with the caveat that we all know those projections will have a lot of variability, but we'll dig into that and say, you know, what, you know, what are the, the range of value? What do you think the market for this company is and why? Who's going to buy it? What, what need does it solve? You know, a lot, a lot of those kinds of of questions. And so what we try to basically uh, do is get our clients comfortable on both sides of the equations, whether the, the, the quote buyer or seller, that the answers to the questions they're worried about are, are you know, are, are answered and that the te technology or the venture is still early enough stage 
that there's really no other better way than to value it based on the amount of money that's been put in to date. If you, if you do all that due diligence and find, you know what, this is a, you know, $10 million ramp up budget and they've spent 9.5 and there's only 0.5 budgeted left to spend. And, and, you know, they're almost at the finish line. You might, you might want to say, well, guys, you know, you're probably got a lot more visibility on where this project is than when you started. And maybe we should be thinking about traditional valuation techniques. So that's, that's really the exercise. Naturally, I'm sure there are some granular nuances to maneuvering a cost-based approach instead of maybe the more familiar or traditional discounted cash flow approach. Can you break some of those down, right? Where would you find that there are potential roadblocks or speed bumps that uh, investors will encounter as they try a cost approach methodology? And what are your strategies for avoiding that? Yeah, well, so I'll, 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 if I could, I'll answer that question maybe in, in two ways. Um, you know, the, the first is, is, is kind of directly to answer your question, which is, you know, what are some of the things that we often will, you know, will find in the context of doing this? And, and, and it's, it is really interesting. I, I think a lot of people focus uh, on that due diligence process on, on making sure, you know, has this technology developed to the point that you, you know, that you could use more traditional valuation techniques. But I think a, a more difficult question to ask, and this gets, gets very tricky, is, you know, kind of how do you find out if the technology really isn't as great as it was originally thought to be? In other words, if you were going to say, um, you know, you've 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 kind of gotten halfway through the development process. A lot of times, people will find, well, maybe the market's not as great as we thought, or maybe it's going to cost more to build this thing than we thought it was going to build. And and, and you know, you, if you're thinking about the same kind of pricing scenarios at a you know double the price, you know, is it as profitable? Does it does it make sense? Um, so that's that's one of the the biggest nuances is to say, you know, kind of how do you look at it and and make the objective decision, you know, maybe this is an investment that should just be written off or at least written down. Um, and that kind of gets to the second part, the second part answer of, of your question, which is, you know, kind of more directly, you know, the nuts and bolts of what some of those nuances are. And, and, and these, you know, honestly are really not as critical as more the due diligence element side, but, but one of the ways that we've looked at it a lot of different ways in, in looking at these cost base uh, uh, assign, assignments where, you know, we end up using a cost-based methodology. And the, the first is depreciation should, you know, is, is, is the work that's being done all still relevant or should some of it be depreciated uh, as, you know, as, you know, so say, say $5 million has been spent is, you know, is all five of that really useful is all five, you know, should some of that be depreciated relative to the, you know, an ongoing valuation. And then, you know, the other is, is inflation. You know, some of these things take a really long time, and especially in an environment like we are in now where everybody's talking about inflation, oil prices are going up like crazy, gas prices. Um, you know, that, that sometimes can be a relevant answer. And, and, you know, honestly, we've looked at both of those things, you know, various different ways, and it's, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and I think that's important to, you know, to take um... – take these strategies and apply them with a grain of salt and that there is going to be some level of nuance that's going to arise from your specific, and I'm talking to the audience, right? Your specific uh, investment strategies, your specific portfolio uh, that should define your approach. Uh, but even with that in mind, are there any just sort of standardized valuation methodologies that you think should be a starting point for consideration, uh, again, for venture and early stage investments? Just anything that you would consider a great foundation uh, or a starting point for really any investor, regardless of the nuances of the situation? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good a good question. I, I guess I would would make two points with regard to that, which are kind of <laughs> different. I, I'm, I'm you know kind of picking your question in, t in two different different uh, tones, but the the first is really thinking about it. As we started out, we talked about really where we're seeing most of this being either on the technology side or the project side, and I think on the project side, it's a lot easier. You really do almost have a you know, a hard line in terms of, you know, everything before this line, when you get your contract signed and your permits in place and your EPC contracts and your, 
you know, your offtake agreements and, you know, the, you know, all the different things that you need to get, get done when you, you know, really get a critical mass of the most, you know, critical of those items, um, you know, that's when you reach the stage that you should, you know, move away from a cost-based methodology to a, a more traditional valuation technique. With technology-based things, it's it's really a, a sliding, um, you know, continuum, isn't it? Because, you know, it, it could be as early stage as an idea with a management team, some maybe some technical guys, some engineers, or it could be something that's been developed, tested. Maybe you have a, a, a prototype. You know, there's there's really a, a, a pretty wide range. So that's that's when our job and and and, and management or the you know the private equity firms job is the hardest is to really be honest with yourself and say, you know, where do we stand here? What, you know, if we're honest in terms of the assumptions regarding any projections we put together, what, what does that look like? And, you know, oftentimes we, you know, th- those, those discussions can be really lively and, and, and really, um, you know, help both a management team and us figure out, you know, where they are. So I guess that's, that's uh, one piece of it, but I wasn't sure if, if maybe, you know, another way to think about this is, you know, we do talk a lot about projections and, you know, anybody who's building a business, you know, even if those projections can have a really wide range, as we talked about at the beginning and at the bottom end, the end of the range, it's a negative value. And at the high end of the range is some crazy high value. You know, if you if you kind of take the middle of that range, you know, what, what maybe what management or the company thinks is, you know, is the best guess. And we all caveat that that's going to be a really wide range. And if you take that set of projections and compare it to what the cost based valuation gives you and include any, you know, future development costs, et cetera. um, If that number that, you know, internal rate of return that you calculate based on those, those, uh, those, those inputs, if that comes out to be a range that's especially below where you might see, uh, like for instance, in the Fed study, if you're to, to do all this and see a, a number that comes out to be like 5%, 10, even 10%, you might, it, it's, it's for us, it's kind of a red flag. It, you know, maybe that's right, but maybe it also says, hey, you know, maybe this thing has come far enough along that you've changed some of your inputs and expectations that maybe this isn't such a great investment anymore, or, you know, maybe it's, you know, 400%, in which case, you know, maybe it's just going to be a really great investment. But if, if that 400% is based on something that's really defensible, then you should be using, uh, you know, regular valuation techniques. Well, on that note, James, I think that does it for our conversation. We've covered the basics of maneuvering some of these early stage private equity investments. And again, I'll point our audience to an article that you wrote on this subject, which we'll link in the piece below. uh, And we'll also uh, include on our website, you can also find it titled Valuation of Venture and Early Stage Private Equity Investments in Energy by James Hansen. James Hansen, thank you so much for your time today on E2B. It's really been a pleasure breaking this down with you and getting into the nitty gritty of why some of these traditional methodologies don't really apply for early stage companies and what you would suggest as an alternative, as well as how to gauge what those granular metrics are going to have to be for your specific investments, again, to our audience. So thanks so much, James Hansen, Managing Director with Opportune for your perspective today. And James, if folks want to find out more about you or about your thought leadership, or maybe they want to get in touch for more perspectives on this subject, how can they get in touch? How can they learn more? Yeah, the, the best way is, like you said, on our website, we've got a lot of uh, thought leadership and a lot of interesting articles written by you know people in a lot of uh, different functional areas in and around the energy sector. So uh, a lot, lot of good stuff. If, if anybody wants to get in touch with, with me directly, uh, my, all my contact information is on our website. Uh, so I'd be happy to, happy to talk to people. Fantastic. James, thanks so much for your time. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks very much. And thank you everyone for watching another episode of E2B, Energy to Business, an opportune podcast. If you like what you heard and saw and you want previous episodes of the show or you want to make sure you don't miss out on future conversations, make sure you're heading to our website, opportune.com. Again, opportune.com, as well as subscribing to E2B on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Energy to Business.